Good morning. It's time to start our class. I think we're on page two of the lesson on, I don't even remember what the title was, Petition and Supplication. Before we get started this morning, Benjamin's going to lead us in a word of prayer. Amen. All right, well, did we have anything else we needed to talk about? With benefits you see in Thanksgiving being a plot, being coupled with our prayers and petitions. I think we covered that pretty extensively, but just in case, if there was <clears throat> anything additional that you thought of or wanted to mention, we could talk about that before we get started this morning. Okay, well then we're on the back page. What spiritual petition should each of us be requesting from our Heavenly Father? And I think I talked a little bit about this question on Wednesday because I said there might be some things you uh, weren't comfortable sharing with the class. <clears throat> but I think there are enough things that we could share together that uh, would be helpful for all of us to think about as far as things we ought to be asking God for um, fairly regularly. I think, was this the one, Jeff, that you mentioned? The I think it was, the, the prayers of Paul. And um, we see several of Paul's prayers, if not verbatim, at least what he re recalls and relates to the churches that he spoke to or wrote to. Um, the church at Ephesus, the church at Philippi, the church at Colossae. Um, there are several ideas that are mentioned in each of the beginnings of those letters that he had prayed on their behalf. And those all contain things that would be helpful for us to think about and certainly petitions we ought to be making from our Father for us. Um, but but let, let's think some specifics, I guess, breaking down that prayer, or those prayers a little bit. I don't remember which one it was you mentioned. Was it the one in Ephesians? Ephesians or Colossians chapter 1 relates a lot of things that he was praying on behalf of them. <clears throat> but what are some things, what are some things we should be asking God for? And I will, I'll add regularly. Okay, wisdom and understanding. Um, a, a, better, a better understanding, clearer understanding of the Word, um, and then the wisdom to apply it in the situations that we face. Because, unfortunately, and this is one of the things that you run into, is that when you start talking about practically applying various principles of Scripture, there are perhaps a million and one different scenarios that we could find ourselves in in our lives. And so <clears throat> one of the things that I found difficulty with preaching is everybody wanted to talk about practical application, practical application, practical application. Well, I mean, how I would apply it in my day-to-day -day life with the scenarios that I face um, may not be exactly the way that you would apply it in the day-to-day -day scenarios that you face. Um, we, we face a lot of similar circumstances because we all live on the same planet and we live in the same community and um, a, a lot of the things that we uh, experience are similar to one another, but we're all also different and we have different walks of life and there are different things that we spend our time 
uh, doing. And so applying each of those principles to our specific situations is different. And, and the Bible, because it's seeking to relate principles and show us examples of people who were applying those principles, can't show us every single scenario that we would possibly face. I think that's one of the frustrations as a parent is we would like to find uh, that we would like it. We would have liked it if God had written a rule book for parenting that outlined every specific thing. You know, the telemarketers have uh, a lot of them will have screens where if you respond in this way, their their prompt tells them to respond in this way. And as a parent, it would have been really nice if you could you could open up the book and it says, "Child is throwing a temper tantrum." and here's how you're supposed to respond. Or, child says this, and here's how you're supposed to respond. But God didn't do that. And, you know, the likely, one of the likely reasons why He didn't do that is because there are, again, a million and one different things that a kid could do or say. And if He, you know, to use John's words about the things Jesus did in John 21, if God had spent... His time giving us a rule book for every single thing a kid, a kid might, a child might possibly do, or say, it would have it would have filled up the world, and um, the same thing with all of the other scenarios that we face. God gives us principles, and we need the wisdom to be able to apply them in our specific circumstances. So important for us to pray for understanding, because we need to understand what the principle is, and then. Uh, a better understanding of how to apply it in our specific situation and, and the wisdom to do so. What else? Yes, ma'am. He's on his way. Uh-oh. Okay. Yes. This work, yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, so I went back to see what the then was about. And I think it starts in chapter 1, verse 18 of First Timothy, where he's urged to fight a good warfare. And then to do that, holding faith and in a good conscience, and says what has happened when people didn't do that. And so that's the, the first charge, is to fight well for Timothy. And that's the context of chapter 2. And so because that's what he's supposed to do, the instruction is, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, first of all, and then for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peace, peaceful and quiet life godly and dignified in every way. And so there's a specific instruction of what we can be asking for. And the goal continues into verses 3 and 4. The goal is that that will lead to the salvation of people's souls. And so um, that to me is a pretty strong instruction about what we need to be asking for, for very good reasons. Okay. So specific instructions from Paul to Timothy about things he should be praying for and specifically people he should be praying for. And then as Becky said, the, the real reason for praying for some of that, I mean, with regard to our leaders, I think, you know, sometimes we, we, we read the verse 2 about praying for our leaders and those in high positions, and we think, well, you know, we want to pray for the economy to get better and we want to pray for peace and all those kinds of things. And he specifically goes on to address the reason we want to pray for those people 
is so that we might lead a quiet and peaceable life and that people might be led to salvation. So that, that should be the focus of those kinds of petitions. Um, not our comfort, not our not not what we think the uh, geopolitical situation should look like, but for the spread of the gospel, for the furtherance of God's cause, the kingdom of God is where our focus should be. But praying for all people, um, that's a broad um, idea. And then praying for our leaders. And, and maybe... As, as Becky said, it was, it's both of those praying for all people and praying for our leaders are tied with verse 3, the salvation of souls. So, I mean, in, in, this, in this specific instance, not that we can't pray for other things for other people, but that that is the scope of the focus here in this particular section from the end of chapter 1 through the beginning of chapter 2. Okay, what else? What about patience with other people? Um, patience is one of those themes that resounds throughout a lot of the epistles. Um, the, the servant of God, and in, in Timothy again, the, the servant of God must first be patient. Um, and so again, the, the idea of patience is found in Timothy and found in a whole lot of other places. Um, what, are you, what are you likely to find? And this is where uh, Mark Broyles did a sermon. It's been a couple decades ago now when we were at St. Peter's, Missouri, called pray, Dangerous Prayers or Praying Dangerously. And uh, he was just talking about being prepared for the fact that when you pray for certain things, what you're really asking for. How is patience developed most of the time? Maybe always. It's, diff it's through trial and difficulty. I mean, patience is most frequently developed through trial and difficulty. It's... It, it may come more naturally to some people than others, although I'm not sure that naturally would be the necessary, the, the, the real, realistic way of looking at it. Perhaps the people you look at and believe that they are just naturally patient people have just developed and learned patience over time. Um, because I, I don't think it's one that comes naturally to, really naturally to anyone. Um, it's something that we develop, and we di we typically develop it through difficulties with other people. We there are a couple different words for patience in Scripture. One of my favorite ones is the idea of bearing up under a burden, um, and and I think that's a a good way of looking at it because <clears throat> they they're 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 difficult they're difficulties and. You know, a burden, I think about like lifting weights. Um, a weight is a burden. And when you have the strength to endure whatever the weight is or the burden is, then <clears throat> you are doing, in essence, what patience is looking like. So with our struggles that we face with other people, the, the, the difficulties that are presented by the fact that we're not all alike, and what what drives you or, or what you um, are most bothered by is not what, what most bothers me. And so the more we spend time with each other, we see those little differences and nuances in each other's character. And sometimes it's difficult for us because we, we find this task really easy and somebody else finds it more difficult. And so it requires patience for us to deal with them in seeing this as being such a hard thing. Why is that such a hard thing for you? I mean, it's just so easy for me. But then you could flip-flop the shoes, and something else is really easy for them and more difficult for you, and therefore requires their patience with you. And so patience is an important one. But it's a dangerous prayer, because it's likely to ask God for the 
the obstacles and the difficulties that are going to develop it. And uh, it's that way with a lot of things. John. I was just going to say that your, your point about it being a learned trait, I think absolutely it's a learned trait, you know, to just think about, you know, babies. Yes. Um, they're not known for their patience. No. When they're hungry, they let you know. Yes. Um, and keep letting you know until you take all, care of it. All babies are like that. But I, I've known people who, on the surface, they seemed very patient. Mm -hmm. And I would, I'm thinking of one individual, especially someone from times gone by. And I'd, I'd ask him, it's like, man, he, he just seems cool as a cucumber. Right. It's like, what's your secret? And he said, I just don't care. <laughs> well, that's not the same that's thing as same patience. Thing. No. The, there's a difference between, you know, like the serenity prayer, you know, some things I can't change. Right. And so I'm going to do the best I can. Some right. things I can, there's a difference between some things I can't change and I just have to accept it and I just don't care. Right. There's a difference between those two things. They right. may look similar on the surface, but I think one may be patient and one may not be patient. Well, that's a, that's a good point. But that, that's, I mean, I, you know, like I said before, I think it is a learned trait. I think, I think the danger for us, and this is true in a lot of areas, by the way, so I'm just going to point this out. Um, I think a lot of times we look at certain people who seem to have it together and we think they've just always had it together, that th this is just who they've always been. Unfortunately, as Christians, sometimes we make it seem that way by the way that we conduct ourselves and by the way that we speak, which is really unfortunate because for most of us, we've gotten to where we are through a lot of prayer and a lot of study and a lot of hard work, both on God's part and ours. Um, and so it's important for people to know that, that, and, you know, I think about marriages. I think sometimes we look at really good marriages and we think uh, young people have been led in our society to think, well, they found their soulmate. Um, and the reality is that every good marriage has been built through a lot of work. Um, a lot of getting to know each other and learning to work through difficulties and differences. That, that's how marriages are built. And it's how characters are built, too. And so none of us just happened to look up and get all the great genes that just made this whole process of being a Christian um, so easy for us. Um, it's come through work. And <clears throat> we've developed characteristics. Paul learned contentment um, and likely patience and a lot of other things through his journey of being a Christian and preaching and doing all the things that he did. And we do the same thing. So I, I won't say none of us <clears throat> just because, you know, I guess there could possibly be one of those exceptions out there. But most of us have gotten where we are not because we just naturally are this way. Um, and most of us look at where we are and we realize we have not come nearly as far as we would like to. So there, we are always a work in progress. Um, I think about people who are struggling, have struggled, or are struggling with sin. And, and sometimes when we're patient with them or spend time with them or try to lead them, I have been told, well, thanks for being patient with me, or thanks for thanks for considering me, or thanks for being kind to me. And I'm like, <clears throat> I mean, you're, you're welcome, and I appreciate you saying that, but I, I'm a work in progress just like you are. I'm not, I have not yet arrived. I have not yet achieved. Philippians chapter 3 is certainly just as true for me as it is for Paul. I'm just trying the best that I can to be who God wants me to be, and I have my own struggles. So it's not fair for me to look at your struggles because I don't struggle with that and think, well, you're just less spiritual than I am because you have such a hard time with that. Um, we all have our own struggles that we're facing, and typically those will change over time. At least I hope they do. I hope we get better at some of the struggles we're facing. Um, and then hopefully as we go forward and face other struggles, we'll get better at those too. 
but we're all works in progress and seeking to grow, and it's important for, for us to recognize that and for us to share that with other people, and therefore, as a result of that, to be patient with their struggles. Yes, sir. So this is a, an insight from passage of time in my own life. Used to used to believe that there were people that were in my life or in my circle that were there to teach me patience. You know, they just what is the pers- what is the purpose for this person's existence or this purpose for this person's inter- interaction with my circle to teach me patience? That's awful presumptive because it's just as likely. You look at me as the one that I'm in your circle in order to teach you patience because I'm the one that needs to right. grow up. Um, and I think that's part of learning, learning, as you said, patience. In prayer, we're to pray for our enemies. We're to pray for those people who don't particularly like us or for those people who don't treat us very well. And, and I suppose there are those out there who view me that way. And some of them write me nice notes sometimes. <laughs> um, my mailbox is, is always interesting in that sometimes I'm afraid to open an email for, or, or even an envelope for what might spring out of it. Because I may think it's going to be one subject or, or one tone and it'll be something completely different. So patience is also about seeing and reflecting how um, in in all of our interactions and all of our personal communications and all of our contact, we have often a very imperfect perspective on what's on the other person's mind. And what John said about the the fellow who said, I just don't care, I didn't hear his tone of voice. I don't know why I said that. And I don't know this fellow like John did. But there are instances where there are things you just don't need to care about. There are. There are things that you can say, we disagree on this, or this person's just kind of abrasive in this way. Uh, and I just need to put that aside because it's immaterial. It's just a matter of personal preference. It's just, I don't like the way they dress. I don't like the way they wear their hair or whatever it is. It's just... There are things for which I shouldn't lose my patience over the differences between people. Right. But I also, I think the, the, the real hard message and the thing, that, the thing to pray about is our presumptions that other people's treatment of us is because they're out to get us. And things that can be done rather innocently or even unintentionally that we may find distress or harm in may not have been intended at all or directed toward us whatsoever. We're kind of self-centered people. We're kind of selfish people. And we lose patience often because we think everyone's out to hurt us or take advantage of us or, or do something to put us in a bad light. And quite honestly, there are a few people that behave that way. Most people don't have the time to dedicate their life to making you miserable. It's just not worth it to them. Are you saying I'm not as important as I think I am? That's kind of what I'm getting to. (laughs) And I think that um, praying to help us uh, see our place in the universe, that's maybe kind of a broad way to put it, but to put our own life in perspective will help us to be patient because I can be just as much a source of irritant and probably more than most people are to me. Well, and I mean, and, and again, I think that's part of our willingness to pray some of these things that, that, the, that the Scriptures talk about us needing, is that when I pray for patience, and if I, again, if I get specific, the more specific that I get about the various things that I pray about and the various things that I confess, whatever it is, the more specific that I get the more I hone in not only on what bothers me about whatever it is, but the more sometimes what comes to light in my own mind is how silly it is for me to be bothered by that when I have this beam that's sticking out of my own eye or, or whatever it is. So, I mean, again, the more specific we get about some of that stuff, the more helpful it is for us to see even our own flaws 
and our own need for patience from God and our own appreciation of the patience that He does show us. And so all of those things can kind of go together. And again, that's why I think it's so important when we pray that we get as specific as we can because of the insight that it gives us into our own lives and where we really need to be. So, Joy, I hope I didn't walk all over what you were going to say. You, you did make some points that I was going to make, but that's good because it's good lead-in. Um, and it was that um, in reading and listening to the book of Psalms and who wrote them, what he had done in his life, and how God showed him patience is very comforting to me in that you know, David was a, a man after God's own heart, um, and there were things that God had to be patient with him about and was, and so some of the things uh, that he did, I'm not particularly uh, guilty of, but other things. So I'm just making the correlation that if God was patient with David, God can be and has been patient with me. And if I know that really, really well, that will help me to be patient with other people. Yeah, and Greg brought up another idea too. I, I kept saying patience with people's struggles, but sometimes it's just patience with people's differences. I mean, we sometimes struggle with people being different than we are. Um, and, I mean, Greg even brought up as simple as the way they dress. Um, what, what, what the differences are are not necessarily wrong. Um, they're just different. And because we, uh, you know, and I don't know, I don't know if it's... Uh, I, I'm, I'm inclined not to believe that it's who we are because we're people. I'm inclined to believe it's who we are because of the influences that we have around us. But we, we just have a real tendency, or maybe it's because we like to be comfortable. Um, we have a real tendency to want to gravitate toward people who are just like us, <clears throat> or more like us, I guess would be the better way to put it and to uh, kind of avoid people who are less like us. When the reality is that being around people who don't, don't do things the same way that we do, and <clears throat> you know, whether it's the way that they dress or whether it's a, lot of, a whole host of other things, can be an enriching experience for us to... to to learn some of these kinds of qualities, patience, um, maybe wisdom um, in, in applying some of these things. So, I mean, the reality is as much as we want to try to just spend time with people who are like us, it actually benefits us in some ways as much or more to spend time with people who are not. Um, and to, because, the, I mean, the reality is Acts 17. What are we all? God has created from, uh, from one, and the most translations say one man. The literal translation from the Greek is that God has made from one blood all men. We are, we are all, every one of us. Mankind is a single species and a single race. That's just the way it is. There was within Adam and Eve all of the genetic material necessary to adapt and to change and to be modified to create all of the people that we see on the face of the planet today. Some, I don't know, what's the population up to now? Seven and a half billion or is it getting closer to eight? I mean, it just grows exponentially. It's, so, it's, it's unbelievable how many people there are on the planet. But we all ultimately can trace our lineage back to a single couple. And really, if we want to be as literal as possible, scripturally speaking, to one person, God created Adam and from Adam created Eve, and from the two of them has allowed the, the formation of everybody else who's ever lived. 
so we can tie ourselves back to them. So learning about all these different cultures and peoples and the way that they do things can be an enriching thing. It doesn't mean we have to change the way that we do it, but it means that we recognize that there are lots of other ways to do it that may be within the scope of what God has revealed for us in His Word. That is a helpful thing because we are much too inclined, and I don't know if it's just us as Americans or us as people or what it is, but we are much too inclined to get ingrained in the way that we do it and think this is the only way when the reality is there are lots of ways that you can apply these same teachings and still fall within the scope of being pleasing in the sight of God. That can be helpful to us. Um, it, it can be helpful to us spiritually and religiously, but it can be helpful to us in a lot of other areas too. So, okay, I, I've digressed enough. Patience. It's, it's important. <clears throat> and um, so, so there's... There's that one. What else? One thing I find myself praying for is success. Okay. So when I started my company 20 years ago, um, a not quite as old as the guy sitting behind me, you know, three feet, told me, you know, work like it depends on you, pray like it depends on God. And I've taken that philosophy throughout my entire career, and now that I run an organization that I have 34 lives, depending on the decisions and the leadership that I make, you know, success is important not only for me because that bleeds down to so many lives that are impacted by what I do on a daily basis. Okay, and <clears throat> when we talk about success, I think it's important, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think Aaron's wrong, but I think it's important that we understand what we're seeking from that. Because there are lots of different ways to be successful. Um, in the business realm, typically we think success is measured by what? It's measured by, by we could say income, but, but I mean, if your outgo is more than your income, then there's no, there's no profit. So usually it's measured by profit. P&L statements, right? Profit and loss. Um, so that's usually how success is measured. Now, if Aaron is successful, will he likely be profitable? But does that necessarily have to be the motivation behind his desire for success? And I don't think it is. And he even mentioned, to some extent, the point of be, him being successful is that it, it affects what? Not just P&L. affects a whole lot of other people. I mean... The, those 34 people who work for him, have, most of them have what? So they have family. So it now becomes an even bigger number. I mean, just one of the employees that he has has <clears throat> five children. So that's seven people who are impacted. Um, and there are, are actually others. I think Donald's got how many? How many? He's got four, but they're not. I don't think they're done yet. Um, so. God willing. So, I mean, it just impacts a whole lot of people. So, it's not, <clears throat> I think, and the reason I bring this up is because I think sometimes we hear a business guy say something about success, we think, well, he just wants to make money. But the reality is, success translates in a lot of different areas. It may be reflected, ultimately, um, on one level or the other in money, and how much is made, because success typically in the business world leads to that, right? If you're successful, you're generally profitable. I mean, those two things usually go hand in hand. But there's a lot more to it. <clears throat> I mean, there are customers that are served and taken care of, and their, their needs are provided for. I mean, let's face it, in our day and age, in our culture, in this place that we live, heating and air conditioning is a necessity. Um, I mean, we, we live in places where if you don't have it, you could freeze to death or you could die of heat stroke. So, I mean, it's a necessity. And so needs are provided. Families needs are provided as the company is profitable and those uh, funds are distributed in different ways to help make their lives more comfortable. 
And so success translates in, so it's not wrong to pray for success. Um, it's wrong to pray for success if all we're looking at is the bottom line and the, the, the dollar. But, um, but it's not wrong to pray for success if we're looking at the big picture and what that really entails and involves. And the other thing is, <clears throat> we Reliable Comfort has a whole host of, and not only a mission statement, but then a lot of values. And when those values are upheld, values like always do the right thing, and striving for success, um, and honesty, and responsibility, and things like that, when we do that, <clears throat> what do those characteristics also do as a byproduct of applying this business philosophy? Think about it. I mean, I'm asking you to read my mind a little bit, but let's bring it to a spiritual level. What do those characteristics do? What, is it, what, what does it do when I do the right thing and when I'm responsible and honest? It builds character, which Matthew chapter 5, as trying to be salt and light, does what? Influences other people and glorifies God in the process, right? So when I am successful in the ways that God wants me to be in the business realm or as a day laborer or whoever it is, <clears throat> if I do that in the way that God calls on me to do, then ultimately it brings glory and honor to Him and can provide an influence for other people. So, <clears throat> I mean, those are all byproducts in some ways or the result of doing um, that kind of thing and, and seeking to be successful in what we're doing and how we're living. I think it's in Colossians. It's Colossians chapter 4 that says... Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all with all your might. That might be Ephesians, might be Colossians. Um, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God, right? Um, or as to the Lord. Do you have something else? And I think also in I think it's Ephesians where it talks about how slaves should behave towards their masters, yes. and we we kind of parallel that to employees and workforce. I think we as Christians should. You know, strive to be successful in whatever endeavors we do because we serve whoever we're serving. You know, people talk about being the owner, you don't have a boss. You know, I, I have many bosses. Right. You know, I have to serve many people that, um, that have influence on, on what we do. But I really think that we need to serve whatever we're doing with all of our heart and pour our mind into it because in doing that, we glorify God. We should strive to be successful. Right. Um, and even if, even if you didn't have a boss, you still have a boss. You do. I mean, you, you still serve the Lord. Yeah. I mean, and when you look at the, the book Solomon and Wealth, you know, wealth is not wealth is amoral. Mm -hmm. um, wealth is what you use of it. And so as we are more successful, we have the ability to help more and more and more people. Right. Absolutely. And I mean, we, we see some of those promises, especially in the Old Testament. Um, with regard to success and prosperity in Israel. Um, and that's some of the stuff that's talked about a lot in Song of Solomon. And <clears throat> that ought not be obviously our, uh, our end goal, but for people who are generous, it, it, it appears, at least in my experience, that God often finds ways for them to have the, the opportunities to, uh, to be generous. So... Um, so, anyway, um, what else should we be praying to our Father for? All right, I've got one that may open a can of worms, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, I put, for help discerning His will when the right path is unclear. How many times in life have you faced a situation where there's been a, a, a diverging path, a fork in the road, so to speak? Maybe it was two times, maybe it had three, uh, maybe it had four, maybe it had more than that. 
And you were seeking, obviously, to apply the principles that God reveals. But you, I mean, maybe when you looked at this fork that had four different paths you could take, initially you could just, you could break one of them off because you knew it was not in line with what God wanted you to be. So you, so you get rid of that one. But you still got three more. Maybe you're fortunate enough to get rid of two of them, and so you just got two. But you still got two diverging paths going in different directions that as far as you can tell are both would both line up with what God would allow you to be or want you to be or call you to be. But you don't know which one to take. And so <clears throat> I put on there the, the, the help in discerning His will when the right path is not clear. <clears throat> I mean, I, I, I've needed that in my life. I've needed that kind of guidance. And um, so, I, I know the, the reason I say it might open a can of worms is because I know typically, traditionally in the church, we're uncomfortable with anything in which God guides us outside of Scripture. Whether it's Scripture that we've read and studied ourselves, or whether it's Scripture that someone else has read and therefore they come and offer us advice or um, suggestions. But I'm not convinced that God cannot be called on to provide us with some kind of influence outside of that. Um, I'm not talking about some miraculous sign that there's going to be um, some miraculous thing that's going to happen that's going to make it clear to me, but some kind of nudge in one way or the other. I'm just not convinced that God does not still act in those kinds of ways. Um, I, I don't know that there's anywhere that would indicate in Scripture that that kind of process has ceased, and therefore I am still comfortable in my own life asking for God to, 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 to help me to see the way more clearly, which, which path would be best to take. Uh, I'm, I'm comfortable with asking that. Maybe you're not, and that's okay. But, um, and I don't know all the ways that he does it. I don't claim to know all the ways that God operates or works or has operated or worked in times past. But I'm not, I'm not willing to limit his ability to help me um, in the ways that he might see I need in order to be um, what I ought to be or, or to be the best version of me. John? I was just going to say, you know, with situations like that, that sometimes you only know looking back. You sometimes. Know, you only know the Lord is, you know, it's like, man, the Lord saw me through that. Looking forward, you know, yeah, we're, we're back in James 4 and, you know, today or tomorrow we'll go here or there. Right. It's like, no, you ought to say, if the, if Lord, the Lord wills. Will. Because the issue is, okay, the Lord has his will, but the devil also has his will. Yes. And then we have our will. Yes. And then we're in James chapter one and, you know, temptation and desire and things like that. And sometimes you, you only know for sure looking back and you realize, and, and you thank God at, at that point. Right. When, be, because sometimes it's, it, it's like said, if you're looking for a sign in the clouds, it ain't going to, it's not going to happen. But you know, looking back, the Lord saw you through that and the Lord was with you in that. That's certainly thankful. true that there have been multiple occasions in life where looking back you can see the hand of God in those things. But but I do I do believe the other can also be true. Not not the sign in the clouds thing, but yes, sir. Well, first of all, you're exactly right because you said you can't specifically condemn that God can't do these things. Right. God's already told us his ways are higher than our ways. So he could do it right in front of our eyes in such a fashion that we would never comprehend what's okay. going on. So that's clearly the case. I will also go on to say that I have been in situations 
that were highly improbable situations that worked out to good things that one just has to either chalk it up to extreme luck or, or God came in and, and arranged things in a way that were to his benefit. So my problem is with being able to prove it, like you said. I can't. And I think that's but part of to. each one of us is to make that exploration ourselves. Yeah. And can we see in our lives and in the lives of those around us ways that God has acted that demonstrate he loves us in a way beyond time and chance? Uh, I think I've seen that. And I think that helps the journey. And maybe you haven't got there. I would just challenge everyone to keep your eyes open. Yeah. And